Thank you very much for coming to, uh, is, I believe this is the fifth annual Constitution Day program here at Case Western Reserve University. The purpose of Constitution Day is to uh, encourage people to think about and reflect on the uh, role of the Constitution in American life. And that is usually understood by people when they talk about the Constitution as a matter of what the Constitution says. So we have all these arguments, particularly at times when we're confirming Supreme Court justices or when there has been a really big <laughs> case about what the Constitution means. But what the Constitution means is not the same as what the Constitution does. <coughs> because the Constitution as a political fact has effects only to the extent that it is part of the political process. And for some issues, the Constitution is not significantly a part of the political process. And for others, it is very much directly a part of the political process. Now, that, of course, is a political science professor's perspective, but I'm Joe White. I'm the chair of the Department of Political Science at Case Western. I should be expected to think that way. Um, and when we've had this, and when I was discussing with Professor John Enton of the School of Law, what a good program for Constitution Day might be this year, one of the reasons we thought about the death penalty was because the death penalty is a policy issue, a political decision, which is directly affected by the courts in many ways. It's not like, say, health care reform, where the courts might have a voice, but the courts are not the dominant player. But in the death penalty involves the enforcement of the judicial power, the use of the judicial power. And so the Constitution then really is central to the politics and policy of who the government will put to death. Uh, so the purpose of today's discussion is to go over the, the issues related to the death penalty. And some of those issues are, of course, debatable in terms of what the Constitution says, allows, suggests, whatever words you choose. But there are also, you know, if the Constitution could allow the death penalty and the society could still decide not to do it, right? There are further issues of morality, of prudence, of effectiveness that could also be asked about the death penalty. So I want to encourage people in thinking about the death penalty in the Constitution today to uh, not think simply in terms of constitutional law, although that is extremely an extremely important part in constitutional interpretation, although that is an extremely important part of the policy making regarding who the government will put to death. For today's program, uh, we have assembled uh, the largest panel in my experience as a, <laughs> as a program host at Case Western Reserve University. Uh, and here's how that it will work today. We have three members of our faculty, Professor John Enton, Associate Dean of the School of Law, uh, Associate Professor Michael Benzer, and uh, also from the School of Law, and Shannon French, Professor of, of Philosophy and Director of the Inamori uh, International Center for Ethics and Excellence. And they will each speak briefly about their perspectives on the death penalty and on the death penalty in the Constitution from their very different, and they bring to us very different backgrounds. Um, Professor Enton is a broad constitutional law scholar, although he has done death penalty work. Uh, Professor Benzer is a litigator on death penalty cases who has a, co a case coming to the Supreme Court this fall. And Professor French is an ethicist who has worked particularly on a different part of the question of government killing people, namely the law of war. Uh, and then we have, and so they will speak briefly, and then they're going to be um, interrogated, questioned, <laughs> given opportunities to respond uh, by a panel of uh, students in the college, in the, in the university, uh, you know, undergraduate students who have all, um, who have been selected uh, based on their uh, extremely good work uh, in Professor Tadakoff's courses. Um, and uh, they are Cheyenne Chambers, Andrew Wolf, Mirella Turk, Brandon Mordu, and David Mattern. And so they have been working together to prepare a set of interesting questions. Uh, we organized the panel 
this way last year, and it worked beautifully, so I am really looking forward to hearing what they have to say, the questions they pose. Uh, they will pose a set of questions after the short remarks by each of the faculty speakers, and then we will open it up to further discussion uh, for you to pose questions. When we get to that point, I would appreciate it if you would come to this microphone, because we, we, we are recording this so that people who can't be here uh, can, can hear or see the program. And so I would appreciate it if, if when we get to the question session, the audience uh, participation session, you just line up here to pose your questions. Okay? Any questions about the procedure? <laughs> In that case, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce my close colleague, colleague, professor of law, and actually political science, uh, John Anton. Thank you, Joe. Um, and I guess I should say uh, as well, thank you to Senator Robert Byrd, um, who is responsible for the requirement that universities that receive uh, federal funds uh, provide an opportunity for discussion of the Constitution uh, every year on this day, which is the uh, anniversary uh, of the uh, of the Constitution. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Okay, now I want to make three basic points here to set the stage for the discussion. First, the Constitution contains language suggesting that the framers did not intend to outlaw capital punishment. The Due Process Clause states that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. This language suggests that the original understanding of the Constitution contemplated the existence of the death penalty. Now, this observation doesn't really end the discussion. For example, the language of the Due Process Clause contains a limiting principle by itself. The death penalty might be permissible as a general proposition, but only if it is imposed through constitutionally acceptable procedures, that is, with due process of law. There is room for debate about what due process of law means. What kind of trial would we have? Before what type of jury or other fact finder? Based on how much evidence? In what circumstances is the death penalty appropriate for certain kinds of heinous crimes? Second, just because the original understanding of the Due Process Clause accepts the legitimacy of the death penalty in at least some circumstances, there are other methods of constitutional interpretation that might support an attack on the legitimacy of capital punishment, either in general or in some situations. Courts have relied on pragmatic, prudential, consequentialist, empirical, and institutional analysis at various times to interpret the Constitution. And it's possible that we could craft an argument based on alternative approaches that might suggest that the death penalty in at least some circumstances might be vulnerable to attack. Third, regardless of the possibility of attacking the death penalty under the Due Process Clause, other provisions of the Constitution bear on the constitutionality of the death penalty. In particular, the Eighth Amendment prohibits the infliction of cruel and unusual punishments, and the Fourteenth Amendment forbids states from denying any person the equal protection of the laws, a mandate that the Supreme Court has held applies as well to the federal government. In fact, Modern constitutional challenges to the death penalty have relied on these other provisions. The Supreme Court, in construing these provisions, has not always relied on the original understanding. For example, the court has said that cruel and unusual punishment under the Eighth Amendment, that definition might change. The court has found sometimes that evolving standards of decency make the death penalty cruel and unusual punishment in some cases. For example, uh, child rape, uh, the case uh, from a couple of years ago that generated a lot of discussion. 
Other times the court has rejected the argument that cruel and unusual punishment applies in, in certain death penalty situations. The issues here really relate to what crimes might justify the death penalty. Besides treason and first degree murder, for example, as I, I mentioned, uh, what about rape or child rape or kidnapping? What types of defenders may be executed? The very young, the mentally ill or the mentally impaired, for example, are they, could they be executed? By what method may people be executed? After how long a time awaiting execution? Or after how many tries, something that is an issue here in Ohio because of the broom uh, situation uh, just this Tuesday. Moreover, although there is a strong statistical correlation between race and the decision to impose capital punishment, existing law makes it virtually impossible for a challenger to make an equal protection argument that, that uh, the death penalty has been imposed as, in a racially discriminatory fashion. In short, the death penalty, as the Supreme Court has told us, the death penalty is constitutionally permissible in some circumstances. The contemporary legal debate, therefore, centers on exactly what those circumstances might be, not on whether it is ever possible under the Constitution to impose the death penalty. With that, let me turn things over to Mike. Um, I, I want to hopefully correct something that, that Dean Enton said. Uh, the question is what, what type of defendants get executed, not defenders, because otherwise I'm in trouble. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I have spent my career uh, representing people sentenced to death. Uh, I currently represent people uh, in Ohio, Indiana, uh, under death sentences. I have done capital work at the trial level, state appellate, state post-conviction, and federal habeas. And so I approached this issue um, with a slightly different perspective. One is, uh, of course, as an academic and putative scholar, um, what are the, the deep thoughts about the death penalty? But then the other is, what is the real world application? Um, how do we make these decisions that go into deciding who dies and who lives? Um, and I work around the framework as Dean Enton has described it. You know, what does the phrase due process of law mean? Uh, how much process is due in a capital case? How fair does your trial have to be? Uh, how good does your lawyer have to be? Uh, it's one of the questions that I will be discussing with the Supreme Court uh, is how bad does a lawyer's performance have to be before we decide the defendant shouldn't die because his lawyer was that bad? Um, and quite frankly, the standards are getting pretty low, which is a little disturbing. Uh, the other question that starts to come up is when we start talking about really carrying out the death penalty, we don't always engage in a discussion about who these defendants are. Um, we have, as, as Dean Enton pointed out, an extraordinarily difficult time, and in fact it's impossible to get the courts to address the question of whether or not there is racism inherent in the death penalty system. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, 20 years ago decided that in fact Racism is inherent in the criminal justice system, and too bad. There's nothing we're going to do about it. And so what you find is the death penalty is being disproportionately applied as a matter of fact to persons of color. It is applied to people in uh, low socioeconomic factors. Uh, they are being applied predominantly to those defendants who commit their crimes in the South. Uh, absent Ohio, which is rapidly rising to the top um, behind only Texas in the number of executions. Uh, but it is primarily a southern institution. It is a system that is applied to people who are poor and people of color, and yet those are concepts that you cannot litigate uh, when it comes to resolving the constitutional questions about the death penalty. Um, like I said, I have spent my career litigating these issues. Um, for example, in Ohio, when it comes to the questions of race, over 50 percent of the members of death row, almost all of whom are men, are people of color. Uh, and Ohio has a minority population far substantially greater than 50 percent white, and yet the death row population is, substantially, is greater than 50 percent um, minority. Those are the types of concerns that raise systemic issues about what it is that we do when it comes to capital punishment, uh, 
although in a great many of those situations that is not something that the Constitution seeks to address. So with that, I'll There we go. Well, as Professor White uh, said in my introduction, I do come at this from a somewhat different perspective because I'm not a uh, constitutional scholar by any means. I am instead a philosopher, and more specifically, my field is military ethics. But that does bear on our discussion today, be due to the connection, uh, that uh, when you talk about who the state can put to death, you're in the same general realm of discussion that you have in uh, the matter of just war and when a state can order entire bodies of people to uh, try to kill one another. So one of the questions that I have to address as an ethicist in looking at these, these questions is what would be the ethical basis for permitting someone to be executed by the state? Do we start with the idea that certain crimes deserve death? And if so, which crimes would that be? And what would we mean by that? What would we mean to say that a certain crime actually deserves death? Uh, there are uh, many arguments along these lines that uh, tend to draw from the idea that a victim uh, by having uh, their rights stripped from them, in the case of murder, all of their rights stripped from them, uh, has created uh, or has left a, a need for justice that has to be answered by the state, an unanswered call for justice uh, to repair that imbalance. Many people, however, find that too abstract uh, and are more comfortable with the approach that comes from a natural law perspective uh, that is the same one used in the just war tradition that essentially says when someone, a murderer, takes someone else's life, they forfeit their own right to life. It's the principle of forfeiture is what it's called. However, the application of the principle of forfeiture in the context of capital punishment is very complicated. In war, you are dealing with a, a more clear-cut case uh, in in the best situations, of self-defense. One combatant trying to kill another combatant and uh, the, um, let's exclude cases for now of, of uh, collateral damage. But in the case of putting someone to death for a crime that they have already committed in the past, it becomes less clear uh, that you have the right to kill them now. They are not presently endangering someone's life. You are not killing them in order to save someone's life you are killing them back to the earlier point as some kind of a justice for the previous act, or you are saying that rights can be forfeited permanently by a single act, which is very troubling from, from an ethical perspective to many people, that you could ever forfeit all of your rights through a single act. Now, depending on where you stand on that, you may have already your answer of whether or not uh, the death penalty is ever an ethical action. But there are other ethical questions that come into the, the mix. For example, even if you do not believe in the concept of desert, you don't think that there are any crimes that simply require of us or deserve that we put someone to death to, to balance the scales, and if you are uncomfortable with the idea of forfeiture, you may nevertheless think that the death penalty is needed for other overriding reasons, such as deterrence to protect society, uh, or the idea that, um, and, and this argument does, does come out, uh, that there is no better way uh, to ensure that future crimes are not committed by this individual, that putting them in prison for life is not as, as certain. Uh, there are paroles, there are prison breaks, that's a less common argument, but it is, it is raised. The deterrence argument has its own concerns. Do we feel that it's permissible to kill someone effectively to deter other people? Because you are preventing them if you don't believe that the system is um, unable to keep them away from society any other means, then you are killing them effectively to deter other people from committing the crime. And that may raise ethical concerns. Can we do that permissibly? And then two other points that I just want to build off of my colleagues' comments. One is this question that has already been raised. Can you ever kill someone as a state-ordered killing in a way that is not cruel or unusual? Uh, what would those ways be? Throughout history, we've had states experiment with ways that they thought were more or less 
uh, cruel or unusual. The guillotine, which sends shudders down most people's spines, uh, was actually invented originally as a less painful and uh, intention, intended to be more humane way to put people to death. Uh, but uh, we don't necessarily see it that way today. So this point about changing perceptions is valid, but it raises this overarching question, can you, as a state, put someone to death in a way that doesn't cross that cruel and unusual threshold? And then finally, the issue that has already been raised by my colleagues, but is certainly a moral question. Even if you believe that the death penalty is required for any of the other reasons that I've named, you think that certain crimes deserve death, can we be sure that the system is picking the right people to put to death? And what is our bar going to be if a single innocent person is put to death falsely for a crime they did not commit? Is that risk so great, such an overriding moral concern, that as long as our system is imperfect, we cannot permit any executions? So that's the other question that is, is raised in the mind of the ethicist. Can we ever have a system that is just enough that we can let it go forward, or is the risk of even one innocent person being killed so great that it overrides any other worry you might have? Thank you very much, Professor French, Professor Benzer, and Professor Enton. Uh, now we turn it over to the student panel to pose its questions. My name is Brandon Mordew. I'll be the first panelist. Um, despite the fact that you covered some part of our questions <laughs> in each of your introductions, this will be in anyways. In the summer of 2008, the Supreme Court ruled in Kennedy v. Louisiana that the rape of a young child could not be punished by death. Additionally, minors under 18 and the mentally incompetent cannot be executed, and now, barring treason and other high crimes against the state, only murder can be punishable by death. The question then is who? If anyone, should the state be able to kill from both a moral and legal standpoint? Who do you want to go to? I, I can go you first. Can go, okay. I'll just deal the moral part and then toss it over to you <laughs> expert guys. You know, I'll just quickly deal with the moral part. Um, well, speaking to the point that I raised about forfeiture, the issue, of course, becomes if you're uncomfortable with forfeiture at all, it is usually because you are worried about the notion that someone can forfeit certain key basic rights. And the one in question for us today is, can you ever forfeit the right to life? And what action would require that? Those who think that you can forfeit the right to life feel that for balance, for, for um, a sense of justice, the only thing that would qualify would be having stripped someone else of that exact same right. So having uh, committed murder, mates that bar, but other crimes, however devastating they are, don't quite hit that mark. But um, this is certainly uh, only the case if your focus is on the forfeiture piece. Uh, if you are more concerned with desserts, you may say other crimes are so heinous that death is the appropriate response, uh, the appropriate dessert for that um, crime. You may also feel that some crimes are so heinous that deterrence must be as high as it could possibly be, and the best deterrent is capital punishment. I, I guess the short answer is, uh, constitutionally, we can probably kill anybody we want. Um, you know, the, Dean Edge is right. The, the Constitution clearly envisions capital punishment as an available punishment and doesn't lay out any boundaries for it. It doesn't say only murderers. It's only in the recent past, in, in the last, uh, you know, in the case of child rape cases the last year that the Supreme Court very clearly stated that it requires a homicide in order for the defendant to be eligible for the death penalty. We historically have executed everything from adultery to witchcraft to um, cattle rustlers. I mean, you know, we've executed lots and lots of people in our history that we look at today and say we don't kill those types of crimes. So as a constitutional principle under the strict looking at it, you could kill anybody. Um, and the question really has become as we flush out these ideas that there are certain people we don't kill, we have decided that we're only going to execute people who kill, but then we're only going to execute a small subset of those people. Uh, we're not going to execute everybody who commits a homicide. It requires a special type of homicide. 
And then it requires, outside of just the crime, a special type of defendant. Because we recognize that even if you've committed a particular type of crime for which we think the death penalty would be an option, uh, you've killed somebody, one of the, the major areas of making you eligible for the death penalty is to kill somebody during the course of an underlying felony. So you're raping a victim and we cover up the rape, you kill the victim. So we want to make that as a capital crime. Uh, we recognize that there are, however, some defendants who actually commit that very act, uh, who would be eligible for the death penalty, but for whatever reason, we recognize we don't execute that particular defendant. So we then start parsing out as a matter actually now of constitutional mandate of segregating not only the offense for which we execute, but then the type of defendant for whom we are executing, which is why we now have these sort of class exclusions. We do not execute anybody who is mentally retarded, regardless of how bad their crime is. Uh, we don't execute people who are under the age of 18, no matter how horrible their crime is, because we have decided that despite the fact the Constitution does not impose that express limit, it does in fact violate our understanding of the law to not execute them. So the short answer is everybody, and the real answer is we execute very few, relatively speaking, to the number of crimes. Can I just make a quick, very quick point? Um, just, just a quick point that might be of interest. While we have in the, the moral language the idea of a moral agent and, and that these, these folks that we are excluding, we say don't, don't qualify as moral agents because they either have uh, diminished mental capacity or we say that they have not yet matured into a full um, moral agent. But interestingly, in the case of war, that other place where the state kills people, uh, we do permit the killing of child soldiers regardless of age if they are a current and present threat. It's an interesting uh, uh, line that we, we cross there. Is it fair to follow up and say that but part of the logic of the moral agent is that you can't, if you're not a moral agent, you, you can't forfeit mm -hmm. and you yeah, can't be deterred? No, that's exactly right. Well, and even less than the deterrence is the forfeit piece, that you, you can't forfeit your rights if you're not yet a moral agent. And yet we do, I guess, act on a kind of forfeiture if we kill a, a child soldier in Sierra Leone, as, as we've done. Well, let, let me pick up on this because I think that that may help us to understand some of the class-based exclusions from the death penalty. Um, for example, we do not, the Supreme Court says we do not execute people who were under 18 at the time that they committed a crime, a, a, an otherwise capital crime because we do not think that people who are under 18 as a class are sufficiently independent moral agents to be that blameworthy. It doesn't mean that these folks walk free on the street. It simply means that we lock them up for a very long time, but we don't kill them. Similarly, we do not execute people who have mental disabilities, whether they are legally insane or retarded, um, because the theory is that these defendants do not have the moral agency or the mental capacity to appreciate the relationship between their crime and the ultimate punishment of execution. The child rape example gets to some of the themes that, that we talked about earlier. Um, the child rape case came up because in the late 1970s, the Supreme Court held that it violated the Eighth Amendment, it was dis constitutionally disproportionate to execute someone for the rape of an adult woman. The theory was that rape is less severe a crime than, than murder. Now, we can talk about that. After all, if you are murdered, you are dead. If you are raped, you live with that experience every day, every hour, every minute for the rest of your life. In any event, the Supreme Court determined that the death penalty for the rape of an adult woman was constitutionally disproportionate, and it did so on the largely unspoken premise that the death penalty for rape was generally limited to African-American men who were either rightly or wrongly accused 
of having raped white women, and there is a very long and ugly history of black men being lynched for the mere suspicion of having uh, raped white women. Probably the most notorious modern example is Emma Till, the 14-year-old African-American uh, boy from Chicago who was visiting uh, relatives in rural Mississippi, uh, was accused of having wolf whistled at a white woman uh, in a grocery store. And he was, he is the most notorious example. But, but it's very hard to understand the Supreme Court's decision about rape being an insufficiently serious offense without understanding that long, ugly historical background. So the argument about child rape was whether the court's reasoning in, in the earlier case uh, could be applied uh, to children as well. And there's certainly language in that decision that suggests that it could be generalized, but the Supreme Court split five to four on that issue. Again, though, in all of these areas, we're talking about how serious is the crime, um, how do we think about the, the victim, and how do we think about the individual defendant who is charged with having committed this offense and then having been convicted, what's the appropriate punishment in light of all of that? All right, we've talked about some of the limitations based on classes of people that might be executed. My question is about um, the procedures for execution. Have there been any past limitations on how we execute people? And do you think that there will be any future ones, perhaps, based on their <laughs> failure to find a vein um, for the lethal injection case in Ohio this week? Michael, you want to take that one? Um, sure. I could, I'll start with that one. Um, I'll start with a disclaimer. I do not represent Mr. Broom. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I don't have any inside um, knowledge about what may or may not be happening. Uh, please, um, please do just for the audience explain give the case. Give the background of it. Ramel Broom was scheduled for execution on Tuesday. Um, Ohio uh, executes at 10 o'clock in the morning. It gives the media time to provide coverage and doesn't keep the judges up late at night. Um, so we execute at 10 in the morning. There was some legal wrangling involved in Mr. Broom's case that postponed the execution until later in the afternoon on Tuesday. As the uh, prison began the process of inserting the shunts into his arms to hook him up to the IVs uh, to deliver the lethal cocktail, uh, they had repeated problems establishing an IV line. Uh, the facts are still developing. We have an indication that there were at least 18 separate attempts uh, to insert the needles into his arms. There were attempts to insert needles into his legs, um, all of which were unsuccessful for a number of, we're still not sure all the reasons why. Uh, his veins kept collapsing. They were unable to, to hold the IV line. After two and a half hours of attempting to insert the IVs, um, the governor's office granted a one-week reprieve. Um, and said, well, we'll just try again next Tuesday. So 2 o'clock next Tuesday, we're going to go down to Lucasville and we're going to try this again. Uh, the question is, what happens now? Um, and the, the short answer is I have absolutely no idea. I, I can tell you that the lawyers involved, not only for Mr. Broom, but myself involved with a number of my clients, will be running in and out of every court we can find in the next week uh, to litigate this matter. The current accepted method of execution is what Ohio does. It's lethal injection. Uh, we use a three-drug cocktail. We um, start a solution of sodium pentothal, which is supposed to knock you out. We give you a, a solution of pancreatic bromide, which paralyzes you. And then we give you a potassium chloride, which start, stops your heart. The U.S. Supreme Court had this issue up in front of them two terms ago and decided that if this process is done properly, it is constitutional. It would not constitute cruel and unusual punishment if done properly. The problem that you face is the people who are doing it are not necessarily the highly trained medical professionals you would expect because doctors cannot be involved, nurses cannot be involved, uh, EMTs, uh, anybody who is a certified medical person uh, is prohibited either by the state statutes across the country or by the own medical ethics boards of their individual profession from actively engaging in the execution of, of a person. They're not allowed to take life. It sort of violates the Hippocratic Oath. 
uh, you know, not supposed to do any harm. And really what you're doing is you're taking an otherwise healthy individual, strapping them down to a gurney, and giving them a medical procedure designed to kill them. Um, sort of seems to violate all those ethics. I would defer to Professor French on that. But um, that's what we do. That's how we do it. And the question isn't is underlying that whether or not that is an acceptable method, but the constitutional question is can we do it in a way that doesn't result in the torture or the lingering death? Um, one of the issues that Mr. Broom's case presents to us is the question of how many times can we try to kill you before it amounts to cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, an interesting dilemma, and I would love to hear Professor French's take on this, is the concept that we now have decided, amazingly it's taken us till a few weeks ago to decide, that mock execution as a method of interrogation is torture, uh, which raises the question then of how many real attempted executions does it take before that amounts to torture. Um, so that's, that's sort of in a nutshell where we are, and the short answer for Mr. Broom is we've got four days or five days left of litigation, and we'll probably know something on Tuesday. Um, my guess is that Broom's execution will not go forward because we won't have the answers to these questions. You know, can, can I just ask, I, this is just something I've always wondered, and I don't know if anyone on this panel has the answer. I certainly don't, and I hope this doesn't sound callous, but I just think the bald question needs to be asked. Do we not have in 2009 uh, a drug that can kill someone with one shot? I mean, it just strikes me when you describe that, that uh, it's more than not having medical professionals. Why this method? How did it come to be? Surely there's something I can put in a syringe and pop in your arm and you're dead. Is that not true? Sure. Um, we we kill people across it, you know in hospitals every day. People die from you know oops you know we gave you the wrong drug we gave you too much. Um, yeah, there's probably lots of ways. Uh, the sort of crass answer of how we got to this this method was um, it actually started with Ronald Reagan um, when he was the governor of California. It had some some very narrow minor qualms with the gas chamber in California. Um, and so he sat around and said, look, I, you know, I'm a rancher, and we put our animals down humanely all the time. And if you're a farmer, it, you, you want to do that. You don't want to torture your, your critters. You, you like your critters. You're going to put them down as humanely as you possibly can. And he started asking the question, you know, why do we use this gas chamber, which is really a nasty, ugly way to kill people? Why aren't we using something like what we'd use on the farm? Where, you know, horse breaks its leg, we put them down with some drugs, and it's, it's humane. I don't torture my animals. And the crass version of the story is sitting in a bar one night, uh, a doctor in Oklahoma was talking to some, veteran, uh, to some veterinary doctors, and he said, how do you guys kill critters? And they said, well, we give them this, and then we give them that, and then, we and then they're dead. And so he drew it up on a cocktail napkin, and that became lethal injection. Um, that's what we use. Every state across the country uses that, act, uh, that protocol that was developed uh, sitting in a bar one night uh, as the method. What's most interesting about that is that any vet that uses that method would be um, disbarred, well, they, they lose his medical license, his veterinary license, because you're not allowed to execute animals that way. Uh, for many reasons, like the fact it's a little shocking when you throw the dog into the incinerator and it comes running out because it's not dead, um, which has happened quite frequently. This method is amazingly not foolproof. Um, you don't always die. Um, it has not happened in, in any of the executions, at least not that we know of. Uh, I'm sure some conspiracy theory has all the death row inmates actually living on an island somewhere. But <laughs> as far as we know, they have all stayed dead after we've done it. But this, the method was designed because of veterinary science, and now the veterinarians are not allowed to use this method. That's shocking. Yeah. You, we've got a whole – how much time do we have to talk about the shocking stuff of the death penalty? <laughs> so I, does the Eighth Amendment prohibit the execution of someone who can demonstrate their actual innocence but has exhausted the procedural options for their cases review? Oh, uh, that is a <laughs> wonderful question. Uh, and it depends on which Supreme – the question is whether – the Eighth Amendment, and I would broaden that to, uh, to, to the Constitution more generally, the Due Process Clause. Does the Constitution prohibit the execution of a person who is factually innocent? Um, amazingly, the Supreme Court has never answered that question definitively. Uh, 
Some members of the court, Justice Scalia has made this point recently, um, have said, no, the Constitution does not prohibit the execution of a person who is factually innocent. Um, but other people on the court clearly uh, have serious qualms about such a conclusion. Um, I would say, uh, for myself, I find this, this an astonishing assertion. I mean, I don't want to be understood as saying that the Constitution is perfect. I'm a constitutional law teacher. <laughs> uh, Michael knows that. He was my student eons ago. Um, the Constitution, after all, is, in some respects, the original Constitution, uh, in an ambiguous and ambivalent way, uh, enshrined slavery uh, in the United States. And we've been struggling with that problem for forever. Um, and there are plenty of other things in the Constitution that, that are either uh, questionable or maybe even downright silly. Um, but the notion that somehow the Constitution allows someone who is demonstrably innocent seems to me to be very troubling. And I'm troubled about this at a number of levels. Uh, Professor White indicated I've done some death penalty work. Um, the person I helped to represent was, in fact, factually innocent and came within 12 hours of being executed nonetheless. We did ultimately uh, get the conviction overturned. Um, the problem, I mean, if you, if you said that the Constitution allows the execution of someone who is factually innocent, um, judges who take that position might well say that the Constitution isn't the last word. For example, if in fact a death row inmate could demonstrate factual innocence, at least in theory, it would be open to the governor or if it's a state case or the president or if it's a federal case, the executive has the power to pardon, to grant reprieves, to commute. Uh, and, and so from an institutional standpoint, people who would say the Constitution allows the execution of someone who's factually innocent would also say, but we are, courts and the Constitution aren't the only place in the, in the process. And it is up to other branches of the government, like the executive, to make sure that factually innocent people don't get executed. That's fine as a matter of, of theory, but given the way that the political process works, it is very, very unlikely that a governor or a president would actually grant a pardon or a commutation uh, in a case where it appears that, that the defendant is factually innocent. Um, I'm not quite sure how that bears on your view about whether courts ought to find that the execution of a factually innocent defendant is, is unconstitutional, but uh, uh, it is clearly a very difficult, troubling, and unresolved question this many years after the adoption of the Constitution. I, I want to push on that one, if I may, because uh, a couple of things puzzle me about the question. Uh, one is the concept of due process of law I mean, you can go through the due process of law and, okay, you make mistakes, but you've gone through the due process. So if, if the due process makes a mistake, that doesn't strike me as, in constitutional terms, in constitutional guarantees, um, as, as meaning the Constitution has been violated. I would think uh, that no government plan can promise not to make mistakes. Uh, the, the second thing is I'm not sure what one would mean in constitutional law terms by factually innocent because if the process of determining the facts has concluded the person is guilty, which is presumably the case if they're about to get executed, then, uh, then to say that they're factually innocent doesn't have any legal meaning. And so, and so I'm, I, I'm sort of confused about uh, now, now it seems to me that a, a better question is when the process, you know, or it seems to me the question is when you've exhausted all the possible appeals um, and yet new facts 
occur. Is, 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 is that the situation we're talking about? No. No, I mean, the, the question, it, it most recently came up with the Troy Davis case, um, which was sent back to the district court to have a hearing on, on the validity of his actual innocence claim. Um, he had litigated every possible step in the process, his, his questions of innocence. Um, and so the courts, it, I, I will try to explain Justice Scalia's position, um, as he's expressed it in his writings on this subject, and, and his basic underlying philosophy is you are entitled to a fair trial. And Troy Davis got that. The, the courts have reviewed his case. Uh, all of the constitutional errors that have been asserted have been resolved against him. And so he got what the Constitution provides. He had a lawyer, he had a trial, he had a jury, he had cross-examination, he had his appeals. He had everything he was entitled to under the law. And at the end of the day, if you accept that he is in fact innocent, oops, mistakes happen. And from Justice Scalia's perspective, once you have everything the Constitution entitles you to, then that is the end of the constitutional question. Troy Davis got everything he was entitled to, and now he must go and die. There is just something inherently wrong with thinking that in a moralistic point of view, but from a, cor from a constitutional point of view, I, I think he's probably defensible. Um, you're, we make mistakes in the law all the time. Um, civil plaintiffs get multi-million dollar judgments for injuries that really didn't happen. Um, severely injured plaintiffs don't get judgment clearly when there were mistakes in medical malpractice where it, you lose. I mean, that's why we have trials. And the risk of trials is that the wrong party might win. And yet if everything was done the way it's supposed to be, that's the end of it. And that really is, in fact, I think what Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas's perspective on that is, is the law has done what the law is required to do. If you don't like it, change the law. But they're not going to change the interpretation of the Constitution to provide for this new claim. And then you get into, even if you're, I mean, the, the separate question for that is, okay, let's accept that you don't kill innocent people. What do you do now? How does Georgia prove that they got it right 25 years after Troy Davis's trial? Witnesses may, I mean, and Troy's a little bit different, but take Troy Davis's case out because he has the evidence in his hand, but witnesses may have died, evidence has been lost, the police officers don't remember, they, they can't testify. How do you retry a, a murder case 25 years after the fact? My next question is that uh, some semantic originalists believe that if society... Yeah, <laughs> Some semantic originalists believe that society, in assessing its moral standards, determines that it now believes the death penalty is cruel and unusual, then the death penalty can be unconstitutional under the original meaning of the Eighth Amendment. What role should moral philosophy, and particularly something like evolving standards of decency, play in assessing a constitutional provisions or legal statutes? I think that's me. <laughs> I have no morals. I, oh. <laughs> Uh, you, you assume I do just because I teach the subject? Um, <laughs> anyway, the, um, the question here, I think, is one of whether we believe there is or should be moral progress in a society. And uh, for my own uh, position on this, I, I think that uh, there, there must be moral progress and we must amend uh, our understanding of our of our values uh, in order to fit that progress. Uh, we already heard reference to the fact that the Constitution was flawed from the start with with enshrining slavery, and we have to try to make sure that where we are now and what we understand now uh, is reflected in our laws, or we will have one set of values that is is now fundamental to to our nation uh, and then our Supreme Court having to bring down precedent-based judgments that actually fly in the face of those values uh, that would, for example, uphold slavery or some such. But I, I think uh, the, uh, the tension here is between the notion that we don't want fleeting uh, moral opinions uh, to, to be in the driver's chair. Uh, versus the idea that, that somehow what is written in the past is completely sacred and can never be amended. Uh, 
And I think the way that we try to understand where we're dealing with a true seismic shift in morality versus uh, just a, a whim of the moment or, or something that will fade, it, it does have to do with how, how long the idea persists, what values it's grounded in, what principles it's grounded in. The civil rights movement appealed to fundamental principles that actually were consistent with some of the language of the, of the founding of this country. And you could talk about natural law and you could relate this to um, a larger moral scheme. And this is very different than uh, having to constantly tack and change our legal system because something that was thought to be moral uh, a couple decades ago is no longer not, but maybe in our cyclical nature will become again uh, moral in, in a few decades more. So we have to struggle with that delicate balance and distinguish what is a cyclical uh, change, what is, is a pendulum swinging one way and then back the other, and what is a fundamental improvement in our understanding. It is right that we now understand that slavery was wrong, but we still now have trouble uh, understanding what counts as slavery, which is why you have cases with sex trafficking and, and other other uh, forms of indenture and, and such. That's where the energy can be directed in that case, but there are others that are more subtle. There's a, another issue that arises with this concept that the society becomes more progressive um, with a small p. Uh, so that the death penalty may ultimately be determined to be unconstitutional because it violates now this evolving standards of decency, which is basically a, a constitutional morality question, um, which you can debate as to whether or not nine justices sitting in Washington should be engaged in constitutional morality. Um, but one of the, the alternative questions, and we see this progression happening, we, you know, we don't execute people who steal cattle anymore. Why? Because we've made that decision that it's just not right. Those were not constitutional decisions, however, those were statutory decisions. That was state legislatures deciding that is no longer a death eligible offense. Um, those were not decisions by the courts imposing that type of morality on us. We've had decisions in you know, the Plessy versus Ferguson decision to the Brown versus Board of Education, you know, clearly correcting what we now look at as, a, as a absolutely abhorrent morally decision in Plessy to be corrected in, in Brown and other cases about affirming the, the individual rights of everybody. Uh, but the underlying question is if, if we are in fact in evolving standards, uh, who says it has to be progressive? Uh, we assume that evolving standards is a liberal notion, liberal with a small l, uh, of a progressing, maturing society recognizing the error of our prior ways. Uh, and one of the ways that I, I bring this home when I talk with my students about it is a, a few years ago there was a young man who was a young American who was arrested in Singapore for uh, graffiti, and he was sentenced to being caned. And the vast majority of Americans were outraged that the punishment to be imposed on him was caning because we have long since abandoned in our criminal justice system a form of corporal punishment. Um, the question, however, there was a very large mo uh, vocal minority of people who were saying, wait a minute, maybe this is a good thing. We should bring back caning. Um, and if you're going to have an evolving standard, then the question has to be asked, why just progressive? In which case, Maybe the decisions about executing mentally retarded individuals or under the age of 18 or non-murdering defendants are wrong at some point down the way and will be reversed because of the evolving regression instead of, of progression. And uh, there are uh, the cycles. And there are the cycles. Right. Yeah, let, let me just make one other point. Uh, 37 states provide for capital punishment, at least in some circumstances. Um, the other 13 do not. And as far as I know, uh, the reason that they do not was because the people of those states made a political decision that they did not want to have capital punishment in some cases at all, like Wisconsin has never had capital punishment, uh, or at some point in history, the political decision was made that we don't need to have capital punishment in, in our state or we don't want to have it. Those states made that decision in the more or less conventional political way. That is, 
they did not have courts telling them that the death penalty was unconstitutional either under the federal constitution or under the state constitution. They made that judgment on their own. And that's an important point more generally about the Constitution. Much of the Constitution is about what the government may not do. It is a negative document. It says you can't do this. But even in situations where the Constitution allows the government to do something, it doesn't necessarily require the government to act. There are lots of places where just because you have the power doesn't mean you have to use it. And the very logical question, a point that follows from that, is if there is such a thing as evolving community standards, why should judges decide them rather than legislatures? Um, I want to tackle something um, that we've been dancing around for a little while thus far. Um, in 2007, a study conducted by Yale School of Law revealed that defendants of racial minority groups received the death penalty at three times the rate of white defendants in cases where the victims are themselves white. Um, would the root of this controversial issue between the death penalty and race stem from a violation of the Sixth Amendment in which the state fails to assemble an impartial jury and or a jury of one's peers? Well, there's a lot of law about, about jury selection. Um, it may be that the problem is with, with some kinds of disc racial discrimination in the assembly of juries, but I'd, I'd be careful before drawing that strong a conclusion um, because it doesn't follow that, that if you have a, a minority defendant, an African American defendant say, that white jurors will automatically vote to convict and black jurors will automatically vote to acquit. I think the issue is a lot more complicated uh, than that. There are very complex rules, constitutional rules, about jury selection, some of which involve race and some of which involve people's views about the death penalty itself. There is a case called Witherspoon against Illinois uh, from the late 1960s that, that essentially allows for the disqualification of, of prospective jurors who are sufficiently strongly opposed to the death penalty. And I, I don't want to go beyond that because it's, it's kind of a hard line. There's also, uh, there's also plenty of law about you, you can't explicitly exclude people from jury service on the basis of their race, um, and you can't challenge someone on peremptorily, that is for just on, on some sort of gut instinct. Uh, if it appears that the gut instinct is somehow related to race or ethnicity. But to a considerable extent, proving these sorts of, of claims is remarkably difficult. It's as difficult as, the, uh, as challenging the overall uh, imposition of the death penalty on the basis <coughs> that, it, that it, it is imposed disproportionately on... <coughs> Okay. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. It, it, it's a, that the death penalty is imposed disproportionately on minority defendants. I, I mean, there are good reasons to think that those data are, are, are accurate, that there, that there is a correlation and a fairly strong one at that uh, between race and the decision to impose a death penalty. But in the key Supreme Court case back in the 1980s to which uh, Professor Benza referred earlier, the Supreme Court essentially said that racial considerations are pervasive in the system. And the court was then faced with, with confronting the, the logic of that conclusion, and, and, and the court blinked. Because if, if the idea was that, that juries were more likely to impose the death penalty on, on minority defendants who killed white victims, um, then there were all kinds of earlier decisions in the in the process that might also be infected by racial considerations, and the and the court said the whole system would come crumbling uh, to the ground if we took this logic to to its ultimate conclusion. We're not going to go there, and so you have to. And, and so the court says you have to make this extraordinarily difficult showing that race affected the decision to impose the, capital, the, the death penalty 
on this defendant in this trial. It doesn't matter that, that there's a big statistical correlation. That's not good enough, according to the court. Well, just a, a follow-up question, then. Um, what what is the root? What is the root of this issue? What are other factors that we can look at <coughs> to try and solve this disparity between um, racial minority groups? Well, it, you know, the fact of the matter is, is we don't know. Um, we know that there is an impact of race uh, in capital punishment cases. We know race of defendant. We know race of victim. All of those things matter. What we can't figure out, and I think it's impossible to figure out is where does the racism come into play? Because if you can prove, for example, uh, you, know, you go back to the example of the 1960s of the pot-bellied sheriff standing on the courthouse doors in a rural county in Alabama with an African-American defendant and a white victim, you know where the racism is starting. And you can challenge the fact that you had a racially motivated prosecutor or your judge comes in and he's got the Ku Klux Klan emblems emblazoned on his robes. Those are easy. Um, you can identify that. What we have today is we don't have those things. We don't. We don't well, have. You say the, we don't have them out. out if you have that outright, that's your legal challenge, right? I mean, that's that's what your ground for relief is. Is look, I you know, here's my racist judge. Please give me relief. Or here's my racist juror. Give me relief. And the courts can do that. What we can't point out, and what nobody can identify, is in the typical case without the overt racism yet we know the impact of race in these cases, where does the race come into play? Uh, it's become an either unspoken or a subconscious workings of just the criminal justice system. And the courts have said that if you can't show me where it happened, we're not going to give you relief. And in part, there's a very systemic, practical reason for that is how do we ever send anybody to jail for 30 days for gross negligent jaywalking, let alone execute anybody, if we know that race is going to taint every verdict? And yet we know that, you know, when, as I explained to my students, you know, it's really hard to claim that it wasn't a homicide when you walk in and there's a victim lying there with 37 bullet holes. And it's not usually a suicide. Somebody killed the victim. Somebody must be punished for that. Otherwise, we have no criminal justice whatsoever. And that's the dilemma of arguing this, is we cannot put our fingers on any particular area where race really made the difference, and yet we know it permeates everything in the, in the decision. Okay. We, we could, however, say that if what, we can say a couple of things. One is, as the Supreme Court used to say, um, death is different. Uh, and, and so we're going to have special rules in, in, in death penalty cases. And in fact, at one time, the court seem to be on the verge of, of enforcing such rules. The other thing that we could say, again, it goes back to the political process. If you have enough documentation of systematic racial bias in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in capital punishment, it is possible to go to the legislature, go to the governor, mm -hmm. and say, look, we don't want to be part of a system with this kind of bias. We're not saying we want every criminal just walking around free. That's a very difficult political argument to make. It might succeed in some places. Um, it may also be that trial judges, who are ultimately the ones who impose the sentence, and uh, may find, since they have to weigh, this is the other thing, is that the Supreme Court has said you don't have an, a mandatory death penalty for everybody who's convicted of whatever crimes may carry the death sentence. You have to make an individualized determination. You have to weigh the aggravating factors against the mitigating factors, and uh, so you actually have a second trial after you get a guilty verdict. And it may well be that However this process works out, you may have decision makers who might be persuaded one way or another that they need to be persuaded extra much that this is an appropriate case for a death penalty. I think we need to consider the fundamental question here, and, and, and that is how much injustice are we willing to absorb, generally speaking? Because I, I think what we're almost saying, but what we're not quite saying, is that generally society is perfectly happy 
to absorb a fair amount of injustice for what they see as their security. And that manifests in many different ways. But the average person doesn't walk around in agony worried that our system is falsely punishing some people. Uh, they only get upset if uh, a crime is committed near where they live or work and suddenly they feel unsafe. And so then they say, where's my justice system? And they want to. <laughs> well, I, I, I think most people aren't in agony about it, and I'm not praising that. I'm saying this is, this is a bad thing, that we don't, most of us don't wrestle with the injustice in our, in our system. Uh, we worry more about whether we're safe at, at any given moment. And so the principle that people have to keep bringing to the argument, that have to keep raising up here, is, is it ever acceptable for any reason for the state to put to death an innocent person? And if the answer to that is no, that there, there's no reason, no, you can't put to death an innocent person to ensure the security of everyone else or to deter other people, that there's, there's no other reason that outweighs or, or that justifies that. If the answer is no, then the fact that our system is flawed is a deal breaker. You have to say, well, then we must take capital punishment off the table because the system is going to be flawed and somewhere along the way we are going to put someone innocent to death. But I think that if you did that straightforward question with people who were not running for office, uh, that a lot of people would say, honestly, I am okay with the fact, you know, I, they wouldn't say it aloud maybe, they'd say it somewhere in a confession type way, in a whisper, but they would say, I can sleep nights knowing that, yeah, occasionally someone innocent is killed if, generally speaking, I feel that my justice system keeps me safe. And we have those kind of bargains made all the time. People deal, you know, I, security versus rights is a constant struggle. And, and I think we need to recognize that that's what's going on here, that part of the tension is people are willing to say, I'm okay with that. Let's have Ms. Turk's question and then uh, – maybe we'll be able to fit in a couple of questions from the audience. Thank you. My question concerns the U.S. as a nation and its status as one of the few industrialized countries that still... Closer, closer. Pull it right up to you. Sorry. My question concerns the U.S. as a nation and being one of the few industrialized nations that actually still allows capital punishment. Um, from what I've read, some European countries are not extraditing their terror suspects because the U.S. might execute them, and in some cases they are making the U.S. waive their right to execute terror suspects. So does this type of um, prohibition or allowance, whichever way you want to take it, hinder the administration of international justice, or does it prove each country's sovereignty in terms of capital punishment? Both. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Uh, <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, uh, as long as the United States maintains capital punishment, um, it's very difficult to imagine that the U.S. government would, would take it off the table simply because it might create difficulties in extraditing people. On the other hand, it makes sense if the person is a bad enough actor, you want to you get your hands on this person. Um, Professor Benza teaches criminal law, and one of the first things he does in criminal law is to talk with his students about the justifications for punishment. And, you know, incapacitation uh, is an important factor. So even if you can't execute somebody, you might be able to throw a person in jail for a long time. Um, but it is true that because we are one of the few industrial nations in the world which, which has capital punishment, that makes the whole process of getting access to these folks, even if they're arrested overseas, makes it a lot more complicated. One of the other problems, of course, with the international developments against the death penalty is, for example, if the United States' position in the world slips below that of the European Union and it decides it's in our economic and security interest to become a member of the European Union, we can't. Um, the European Union makes as a prerequisite for joining the Union the abolition of the death penalty. It's one of the things that's holding up Turkey uh, in their application to join the EU is that Turkey hasn't figured out how to get rid of the death penalty. Um, 
you, know, you have a lot of questions about, you know, the fact is that we are doing this, which puts us in sort of this esteemed collection of states like Iraq and Iran and Saudi Arabia and all of China, uh, who execute so many they actually don't even know how many they execute because they just get, they can't keep track. Um, you know, when we talk about these bastions of civil rights and human rights and you suddenly lump us into that same equation, it brings us back to not necessarily whether or not international sediment is, is going to persuade us that, to get rid of this, is, but is this really where the United States wants to be? Um, do we really want to be in the same level in terms of a criminal justice policy as Libya? Um, you know, I mean, it, it, the, the amazing thing would be is if Libya came back and Gaddafi says, oh, we're going to abolish capital punishment, and now that he's the head of the, uh, or on the uh, Human Rights Commission at the United Nations, um, you look at the United States and giving him that platform to talk about us. Um, those things do matter, but it doesn't carry the day for us because, after all, we're Americans and we do what we want. Um, and that really, much more the cowboy attitude, uh, I think, is what carries the day when it comes to talking about the world sediment against, the, against capital punishment. Um, nobody has come to the microphone, so I'm going to ask. Uh, Nick has a question. Good. Um, what is the purpose of evaluating the death penalty or any penalty for the matter through abstract ideas of retributive justice? Is it not logical to evaluate solely through tangible results, such as deterrence or cost? Well, one of the, one of the challenges is how do you measure deterrence? Um, this has been a really, really sticky empirical question that has divided very capable analysts for a very long time. Uh, it's really hard to do a good empirical analysis because what you ideally what we would like to have would be uh, an, an experimental situation out there where some some situations you randomly assign the death penalty and others you assign something else but um, Professor French well, I was going to say, but <laughs> Professor French can t explain to us in much more detail uh, why we don't do that sort of human experimentation. Um, but I, I do think that a considerable part of the of the deterrence argument about the death penalty uh, has to do with the frightening complexity of actually measuring that. Um, and while while there are lots of ways to assess the costs of of, of uh, a system of capital punishment as opposed to say uh, life imprisonment without without parole. Um, as Professor French indicated earlier, a lot of times people want to feel safe and somehow they feel as though it, they are safer if this bad person is going to be executed uh, as opposed to having the possibility at some point maybe of getting out and doing some other bad stuff. Um, I think in constitutional terms though, this raises another nice question which is uh, to what extent should we be construing the Constitution on the basis of the latest multiple regression equation? And, and I say that as somebody who knows how to do multiple regression. I mean, it, it strikes me as at least reason for pause to think that if somebody does a, a, a good study today that, that suggests that the death penalty is, uh, is cruel and unusual uh, or doesn't adequately deter or, or, or whatever, and then tomorrow somebody else comes along and does a, a, a good study that reaches the opposite conclusion, what do you decide? And I mean, I'm not being totally flip about this. In the wake of Brown against Board of Education, some southern school districts actually tried to relitigate whether segregated schools were harmful. Uh, and the courts understandably didn't want to go there. Um, but but you can uh, you can understand I think why courts might hesitate to rely on on empirical studies to construe the Constitution. And and I would just add that that uh, this is my own position as an ethicist, but I am much more uh, almost infinitely more comfortable arguing on the level of principles than on consequences because not only the difficulty of measuring those consequences uh, but um, I fundamentally believe that you are running a tremendous risk when you base your moral judgments or the values of an individual or a nation on 
predicted consequences because that's all they are, are predictions. And you can guess wrong and you're pinning your entire moral life as a nation on whether this does or does not have a certain effect. Whereas if you act on principles, uh, then you have a much more solid foundation. I, I can prove deterrence. And it comes as a shock to everybody. How many of you have committed capital murder? <laughs> How many <laughs> capital murder? No, yeah, right. <laughs> no, capital, I did. No, yeah. How many of you have committed capital murder? How many of you want to be executed? There's deterrence. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, my question is, um, if a, a defendant is isn't um, uh, mentally like retarded. Um, or whatever the politically correct term is for that now, um, but like um, could be prescribed like uh, not uh, like um, some psychotherapy or or, or 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 psychiatric or both or, or both or, or psychological work. Like, uh, is there room in the law for accommodating like that just for a human uh, uh, rights perspective? Yes, depends. Um, we execute people, this comes as a shock to most people, we execute people who are severely mentally ill and who are insane under medical definitions all the time. Um, being insane does not prevent your execution. What prevents your execution is if you are so insane as to be incompetent, uh, to not understand why we're killing you. And, uh, but if you're insane, you can be floridly psychotic um, actively delusional, uh, suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. Um, but if you can answer the questions, yes, I am going to be executed because I killed my parents, uh, and I understand that when they kill me, I will be dead, uh, we can kill you. Um, so yes, the, the, the short answer is we don't even have to treat you. As long as you satisfy that standard, we can let you go floridly psychotic into the execution chamber. And could there be room for, like, I guess you could say improvement on that from the perspective of like that's a, it's which a way positive is better? thing. Do you, you want to kill more people or or, or not? Which way do you think is improvement? Well, um, I don't know because I, I I'm not really I'm kind of undecided. Right. I was I was more curious about the um, uh, room for like uh, k killing less people and right. having. Um, the, if it comes to the question of mental retardation, the court is easier dealing with that easier than they do with the mental illness issue because you can't cure mental retardation. Uh, if you're mentally retarded, you're always mentally retarded no matter what we do. Whatever training, educational supports, things like that, you're always going to maintain the diagnosis of mm -hmm. mental retardation. Um, the mental illness question is very different because mental illness is, except in the extreme polar ends, um, cyclical. You'll have good days and bad days, good minutes and bad minutes. And so it, it gets much more complicated in deciding to exclude people who have mental illness from the, the class of people we execute. Well, I think there's a, a general sort of uh, notion out there among the public that insane people can get off, yeah. that the insanity defense can get you off. And I think what you're saying is, no, that isn't actually the way it works. No. Uh, my questions sort of have has something to do with Solomon's. Um, people who are given the death penalty um, often have a negative childhood history or severe mental illness or trauma. Uh, for example, a man may rape and murder a child because he might have been abused as a child or has a history of being mentally ill or he was in a war and he had suffered severe trauma from that. What do you think the purpose of prison is to punish criminals and separate them for the safety of society or to punish and perhaps help these criminals cope with their past trauma or mental illness? Uh, as a matter of, of peniological principle, I think we've long abandoned the concept of rehabilitation. Um, we no longer pretend that we send defendants or criminals to prison to make them better. Um, we send them there because we don't like them. Um, and we will want to get rid of them for, uh, quite frankly, as long as we can. Uh, you know, there's, there's, you, know you, you give somebody who does the crime the maximum possible punishment because for that period of time, they are not going to bother anybody except other inmates, and we don't care about other inmates. Um, so, no, we don't care about rehabilitation. It is simply a matter of locking them up until we 
can't afford to do it or decide we're going to take the risk and let them out. I should comment on that. Um, this is, does appear to be the current policy uh, virtually everywhere. The reason this is the current policy is it is generally concluded that efforts of rehabilitation have failed for the past 150 years. Uh, the efforts of rehabilitation began with the idea that if you put people in a solitary confinement room and gave them a Bible, <laughs> right, in the Pennsylvania penitentiary, uh, that, that they would confront the Lord and they would be away from, from bad influences and, uh, and eventually they would, they would see the light. Uh, it's gone through very many phases, including if you've ever seen West Side Story, you know, the kinds of things that were talked about in that song. You, know, you get the social worker and so on. Um, but at this point, uh, I think there's a general perception that we don't know how to do it. And so some of the, uh, some of the abandonment of rehabilitation is budget-driven. It's very expensive to fail at it. And if you're going to fail at it, you know, why bother? Some of it is political sort of dislike for the, for the uh, incarcerated, but some of it is just that they don't know how to do it. And there has been a real retreat from rehabilitation uh, over the last 20 or 30 years. Well, on the other hand, a lot, of, a lot of what was driving sentencing policy in that period was this notion of, of, of desert. And it turns out that, um, that the results of that theory uh, have been disappointing as well, and so there's now a, uh, there's now a, a cycle coming back. But, but it, it is true that, that figuring out what works in the way of rehabilitation is, is, uh, is challenging. I think it, is, it would go beyond the data to say that rehabilitation never works, but the level of public patients or political patients uh, with making nuanced judgments uh, has not been very high. Let's have a, a last, oh, sorry. Um, uh, I just have uh, one more question. Um, okay. Okay. Um, in three states currently, I forget their names, um, the names in states, a 16-year-old can be tried as an adult and be put to death. Is that right? Am I... Oh, they can yeah. be tried as adult, but they can't be put to death. All right. I was reading about what happened in well, our state pretty, last Tuesday. So I found a case where in 1947, um, a guy named Willie Francis mm -hmm. was attempt, well, Louisiana tried to electrocute him, but they just shocked and traumatized him. So then they tried to do it again, but... He argued that his anxiety from the experience made it cruel and unusual punishment. And the court voted that, or they said that cruelty must be inherent in the method of punishment and it can't come from anticipation of the punishment. Will that affect what's going on now, the case now? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, Willie Francis's case is, is the only case in which the court has addressed the, the constitutional question of how many shots at killing somebody do you get. Um, Things have changed a lot since 1949 when they when they decided Willie Francis's case, um, and so it, you know Broom's case is probably going to present that issue to somebody again, um, and we may see a different outcome in part because of the evolving standards of decency, in part because we have real concerns that things that may not have been developed in Willie Francis's case that are being developed in Broom's case, such as why did it fail. Uh, it, there's a lot of things behind Willie Francis's case that may have been intentional. I don't know if anybody's seen the Green Mile. There's some indication that there may have been an intentional failure of his electrocution. There may have been an unintentional because the electricians who were doing it were just drunk and couldn't do it right. Um, those types of facts that really didn't get litigated. And so Broom's case is going to present somewhat different factual in a completely different legal environment um, that could end up with a, a, a decision 180 degrees away from Willie Francis. I have one more question. Is it okay if I ask it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, in the Fifth um, Amendment, it says that people have the right to a speedy trial. And with the death penalty, I was reading that it generally takes about 10 or so years to try someone. Is that true or no? Yeah, well, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't take that long to try people. It takes that long for the entire legal process to unfold. And um, so you, 
you don't have a speedy trial issue here, but in fact, in the last couple of years, some justices of the Supreme Court have been debating um, about whether a prolonged delay in the legal process between the time of conviction and the time of execution might itself be unconstitutional. We have no case law on this at this point. Uh, the Supreme Court hasn't been willing to take to, to address this issue directly. But as I said, some justices think that this is at least a hard enough question that the court ought to look at it. There is, I think, another point on this, which is that to the extent that the death penalty is, is justified in deterrence terms, the longer the gap between the, the offense and the imposition and, and the carrying out of the sentence, presumably the lower the deterrent effect, whatever it might be. And, and so that has actually driven some of the efforts to limit the number of rounds of legal proceedings that uh, post-conviction legal proceedings that def that uh, death penalty defendants uh, can get. I should add that I would like to have a Constitution Day program s some year on uh, the speed and the of the judicial system and the extent mm -hmm. to which people actually are tried by juries or their peers as opposed to by uh, prosecutors and uh, plea bargains. Uh, last question. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, during this colloquium, you have brought up recently the recent change to the Constitution in which child rape is no longer an eligible crime to be punished by the death penalty. What are the ramifications of that, do you think? And what are opinions about that recent change? I know that a lot of our Constitution is based on, you know, the human rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I believe that with this recent change where only murder is now punishable by the death penalty, we have kind of started to focus mainly on that first right and stopped focusing on the second mm -hmm. and third. Um, I, don't, I don't think we've heard the end of non-fatal cases being eligible for the death penalty. I know that there is at least one um, state out west, I don't remember if it was Utah or Idaho, but they are exploring redrafting the statute for non-fatal child rape to try and make it compatible with the Constitution. Um, so it, we haven't heard the end of it. Um, it again goes back to the, to the question is, it, is evolving standards of decency only a progressive philosophy? Uh, one of the things that Louisiana had done in the Kennedy case to try and insulate the, the, the statute from constitutional challenge was make very specific findings about why the death penalty was an appropriate punishment for this particular crime. And they talked about the, the huge harm that is inflicted upon a child who is the victim of a non-fatal rape and the damage that is done to society. We know that my client population comes from an abusive background for the vast majority of that. And so there is a, a theory of the society is protecting the next generation by eliminating this generation of, of child rapists because then you don't create future victims who don't then become your future defendants. Um, and you can break the cycle. Uh, they made a lot of those types of very specific findings, and in spite of that, the court said, no, we still draw the line only at, at murder. Well, and I think something we really haven't talked about that much uh, due to all the other interesting things we had to get into here is the, the, uh, the large category uh, of uh, victims' rights. And, and this is important too, and it has to uh, be addressed in part of this conversation somewhere, because you have the, the issue of if, if you are dealing with a crime like child rape that does have lifelong consequences, as my colleagues have both mentioned, uh, what, what is owed to the victim? Uh, and what uh, is the proper response of society to try to restore the victim? Or in some cases, if we are talking murder, do the victim's families have a right? Can you say that the family of a murder victim has the right to see the person who, who killed their loved one put to death? Or is that never a right? Is that not a right we ever want to put on the table, that you, you don't get the right to see someone put to death? Or you know, There's a lot, and, and we even have provisions, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but to allow family members to attend, correct, um, uh, executions because there is this, this uh, recognition in some quarters that that is part of the healing process for them to see that. Uh, I, I, will, I will tell you that when the film um, Dead Man Walking uh, came out, that uh, I was um, 
conflicted, I think is the word. Uh, there's a moment in that film uh, where, where the nun says to, to the convicted murderer that I want the last face that you see to be a face of love or something along those lines. And I remember thinking at the time, certainly what the victim experienced last was not love or anything remotely like it. And is there a fundamental question of fairness to say, we are going to take this much care to make this experience for this individual uh, when this very person created this horrible final experience for this other person. But I, I think the, um, this is where we have to go back to principles and figure out which principle matters most to us and how does it apply in these cases. Because the emotions are not irrelevant, but they can't be the only uh, driving issue. So I would say for, for you, with your concerns on this, that uh, you want to trace back some of these arguments and, and ask yourself which is the most important principle and how would I envision a justice system that put that foremost? Because I think none of us here today have said, yay, we've got it right. Thank you. I think that's a, a, a very fine final set of points here. Uh, first of all, it gives me a chance to remind people uh, that Sister Helen Prejean will in fact be uh, giving the Batisti lecture at 6.30 in Ford Auditorium across the street. Uh, the, the, the nun in question from the dead man walking uh, story. Uh, secondly, uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, the Constitution does not provide people with life, liberty, or happiness. The Constitution sets some limits on what government can do to deprive people, mm -hmm. but it does not provide people with any of those things. And that's a very important thing to remember. And finally, I would like to thank our wonderful group of panelists uh, for, for posing questions, answering questions, framing the debate. Thank you all very, very much, and thank you to all of you as well.